cek satu
Good morning everyone and welcome to today's Indonesia Australia campus to campus virtual outreach event taking innovative business to scale. It is wonderful to be with you all here today in the Kunalulu Theatre for the embassy's first in-person event for a very long time. And for those of you joining us online today a very big welcome from all of us at the Australian Embassy in Jakarta. My name is Emma Burke, I'm First Secretary for Public Affairs here at the Australian Embassy and I'll also be your MC for today. We are very excited to be co-hosting today's campus to campus event in a hybrid format with our friends from the Foreign Policy Community of Indonesia, or FPCI, as you may know them. Before I officially welcome our guest speakers, I'd like to share some general housekeeping for those of you joining us today in person. To keep everyone safe, we kindly ask all guests to wear a mask while inside the theatre. Our speakers may remove their mask as they please when they're on the stage. The restrooms are available outside of the Kunalulu Theatre. Once you exit the theatre doors, turn left and the restrooms are at the end of the corridor on your left-hand side. In the unlikely event of an emergency, there will be an alarm and an announcement over the speakers. Please remain calm and follow the directions of our embassy staff. Lunch will also be provided after today's event and water has been provided on arrival. If you require any water or any assistance at all during today's event, please let myself or my colleagues know. I'll just ask my colleagues and my embassy colleagues to raise their hand Photos and videos are absolutely allowed in the Kunalulu Theatre, but are strictly prohibited outside of the theatre. I'd like to encourage you all to use hashtag Aussie on your social media posts for today, as it's a great way for us to share our experiences. You can also follow and tag the Australian Embassy on social media. We are at Citibez Australia on Instagram, at Ubez Australia on Twitter, and at Australian Embassy Jakarta on Facebook. You can also follow FPCI Indonesia, they are at FPCI Indo on Instagram and on Twitter. Right, without further ado, I'd like to introduce our special guests joining us today. Please join me in welcoming the founder of Foreign Policy Community of Indonesia, Dr. Dino Joel, and President Commissioner of the Bluebird Group, Ibi Non Purnomo. I would also like to welcome our FPCI Research Associate and Program Development Officer and today's moderator, Ma Esther. I'd now like to invite Australia's Ambassador to Indonesia, Ms Penny Williams, to provide opening remarks. Please join me in welcoming Ambassador Williams. Thank you so much, Emma. I'm just going to wait for that lag to... I can... There's still a bit of a lag. Thanks so much, Emma. Good morning, all. Salamat pagi. I'd like to begin by extending my gratitude to our special guest, Ibunoni Purnomo, for joining us today, as well as being President Commissioner of Bluebird group. I'm sorry, I'm really, this, the feedback is pretty bad. <laughs> Keep going? Okay. It's just going to be quite difficult when we get to the other speakers because it's um, echoing in my ears. So, as well as being President Commissioner of the Bluebird Group, Ibu Noni is the Founder and Chair of Bluebird Peduli, which is Bluebird's charitable organisation. She's also a very highly valued member of the Australia Indonesia Institute Board and one of our most prominent Australian alumni, having studied industrial engineering at the University of Newcastle in Australia. 
The connection between Australia and Bluebird is an old one. I actually understand Bluebird's first car was imported from Australia in the 1970s. Although these days, it's Australia that imports cars from Indonesia. I'd also like to acknowledge and thank Dr. Dino Patijalal, Ms. Esther Tamara and the foreign policy community of Indonesia for facilitating today's lecture and for their continued partnership with the Australian Embassy through this campus to campus lecture series. The Australian Embassy and FPCI began this lecture series in 2020 as a way to keep our young people engaged and connected through the COVID-19 pandemic. This is the final lecture in this series and this is the first, as Emma said, where we have the opportunity to meet in this hybrid format. It's really therefore my great pleasure to welcome students and future leaders of Australia and Indonesia to our chancery here in Jakarta. I'd also like to welcome the students and future leaders who are joining us online. In particular, I would like to welcome the students of Venus University in Jakarta and those joining from Monash University in Melbourne and also Jakarta where Monash has established its new campus. So the purpose of these lectures is to facilitate meaningful discussion on the Australia-Indonesia relationship. And today's discussion on growing innovative businesses will no doubt help to continue this exchange. I look forward to hearing both from Ibu Noni and Padino in what I expect will be an engaging series of discussions. Before handing over to my friend Padino, I just wanted to say a few words to set the scene. Today's event is timely. It provides us an opportunity to reflect on how innovative bus businesses can meet the challenges of the pandemic and discuss how innovation can drive private sector growth. Australia and Indonesia have a proud history of responding together to the challenges and opportunities that the world brings us. We meet the challenge of COVID in partnership. We pivoted our development program to respond to the challenges uh, posed by the pandemic, both in health terms, but also economic terms. And we worked closely together, Indonesia and Australia, to develop a regional response. Today, we're working together to respond to the emerging challenge of foot and mouth disease in Indonesia through a two-pronged approach that provides support to Indonesia's management of the outbreak while keeping Australia safe. The good news is that Indonesia's economy is recovering strongly from the economic impact of COVID. Growth is back to 5% and Indonesia's digital economy is one of the standout sectors leading this recovery. Having grown exponentially through the pandemic, it's ex ex the Indonesia's uh, ex economy is expected to be 300 billion US dollars by 2025, making it the largest in Southeast Asia and one of the largest in the world. And this growth reflects Indonesia's growing affluence, growing middle class, and the large numbers of young, savvy, and connected internet users. Australia's Prime Minister, who visited last month after only being Prime Minister for 15 days, brought with him 10 senior executive businesses from Australia. He made it very clear that he wants Australia and Indonesia to have an even closer economic relationship including more business collaborations in digital and much more innovative work together. A really good example of the sorts of things happening in this space is the decision by Bukalapak to open an engineering hub in Melbourne. And it really demonstrates the tangible impact these collaborations are having. One of the challenges that my team and I have is sending that message to Australian companies to ask them to have another look at the sorts of things that are going on in the digital space and in terms of innovation and what young people are doing in this space. We hope to see many more Indonesian and Australian startups working together, finding the skills they need in each other's countries and many more Australian technology companies also bringing their offerings to Indonesia. As our Prime Minister said during his speech to Hasanuddin University in Makassar while he was here, Despite the pandemic, Indonesia is clearly on a growth trajectory that it will make it one of the largest economies 
of the world. And as I said, the digital economy and private sector innovation are driving that. And anyone with of you with a smartphone knows the sorts of access that you can have by using apps. So today is an opportunity for you to hear from someone who's worked so closely in this space. I'm so pleased to see Australian students joining their Indonesian counterparts today to learn from one of Indonesia's most successful business people. And I really do hope the discussion plants the seed for future innovation and collaboration between Australia and Indonesia. Terima kasih. Thank you, Ambassador Williams. And apologies for the feedback. We're just um, working through a technical difficulty with the microphone. We should have it fixed shortly. I would now like to invite Dr. Dino Patijalal to say a few words. Please join me in welcoming Pat Dino. Thank you very much. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Ambassador Penny Williams, uh, thank you for having us uh, here in this uh, auditorium. And my good friend Noni Purnomo, I look forward to hearing what you have uh, to say. And I want to thank the Australian Embassy for always being a good partner for FPCI in promoting not just bilateral relations, but uh, understanding of uh, international issues. So today we're going to hear Noni Purnomo talk about entrepreneurship uh, at a very practical and personal level. And what I want to do is just mention one point <laughs> to you, uh, which is just yes, because uh, there's so many young people here, but I, I need you to understand and appreciate the, the historical significance of uh, entrepreneurship. Yeah. Um, so I was born 1965. Uh, when I was in high school, uh, I was in, it was in the 70s and, and 80s. Yeah. And for many generations, my generation and before that, there was a block to our growth. Yeah. Mental and intellectual block, right? Uh, and you know what it is? For many generations, the word capitalism was a dirty word. Free market, dirty word. And I know this because when I was a speechwriter to the president, I can't use that word, right? Because you can't use that word. No, it's a taboo, right? Uh, competition was not encouraged. Yeah, uh, you have to be like everybody. Yeah, uh, if you stand out uh, or too smart, you know this in school, right? Uh, you be <laughs> you be bullied, right? So, free market, competition, and capitalism all dirty words, right? And you see in Singapore, uh, in China, Hong Kong, um, many places, uh, these are the things that made them grow, right? As a society, as people, as a nation, right? And then what happened? Somebody introduced a new term, yeah? And you know who that is, Chiputra, right? The father of Indonesian entrepreneurship. So he said, Entrepreneurship. And, you know, it's all about capitalism. It's all about competition. It's all about conquering the market, right? But you use a new term, and people feel less defensive about it, right? And in fact, that term changed a lot of people's attitude, right, towards economic participation in society, right? That if you are a successful entrepreneur, then you are a winner. Yeah, uh, look at siapa, Karol Tanjung, uh, you know, Ramad Gobel, you know, all these people, right? They are capitalists in every sense of the world, but they are successful Indonesian entrepreneurs, right? So they're no longer seen as, uh, you know, as something, uh, as a stigma or anything, right? So what I want to, what I want you to understand that it took a while for us to finally get that entrepreneurship is really a key driver for Indonesian economy. And it is implanted in the DNA of this generation, right? Uh, and I'm very excited to see uh, how the young people today, the code word uh, of their DNA is what? Innovation, <laughs> right? Uh, entrepreneurship, you know, openness, yeah, uh, competition, right? Uh, uh, sorry, uh, creativity, right? These are the things that define who you are 
uh, today. And I think Noni will share uh, what she's done, you know, the great things she's done uh, with Bluebird. Bluebird was an old company. It's been around uh, forever since I was in, in, in high school. Uh, but to look at Bluebird today, oh, my God. You know, you have transformed Bluebird into something very different. And yet, you remain as the king of the market. You know, it reminds me of uh, Arnold uh, Schwarzenegger, right? Uh, you know, Arnold Schwarzenegger or James Bond, right? Uh, very prominent in the 60s, right? But if you look at uh, how James Bond evolved in the 70s, 80s, until now, and still the king of the, you know, the, the film industry, uh, that involved a lot of transformation, uh, uh, a lot of remaking, right? A lot of uh, risk-taking, and that's what entrepreneurship uh, is all about. I really look forward uh, to hearing your lecture, and for the young people here, uh, I hope you realize that if anything is going to change your life, yeah, personally, your family's fortune, uh, the society's uh, apa, uh, growth and national prosperity, yeah, Indonesia, Jaya 2045 and all that, uh, is going to be entrepreneurship, right? Uh, if you can embrace that and apply it and spread it, uh, we're going to get there. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you, Paxino. Baikla, mari kita mulai diskusi hari ini. Please join me in welcoming to the stage our moderator for today, Ma Esther, and shortly after our esteemed keynote speaker, Ibu Noni Pranoma. Good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you so much for joining us this morning uh, and being engaged uh, in today's lecture. Today's lecture is the finale of the series of Indonesia Australia virtual campus to campus outreach. And I'm so excited to see you here in person, uh, students from Linus University and students from Universitas Pelita Harapan. I'd also like to greet our friends who are joining us virtually through the Zoom. Uh, we have friends from Monash University and also the public audience joining us from YouTube chat. Today's theme is taking innovative businesses to scale. And we have none other than Ibunoni Purnomo, who's a distinguished expert in this field, to mentor you throughout the one hour ahead. Ibunoni Purnomo is the third generation leader of Bluebird Group. She is currently serving as a president of the board of commissioners there. And she is also active in a number of social causes through the foundation's holding, which is Bluebird Penduli. Ibu Noni has uh, turned Bluebird Group into a multinational company that has a wide variety of transportation services with many business units. Um, and I am so pleased to welcome her to the podium to deliver her presentation in a little bit. But before then, I'd like to let everybody know that we'll be having an open question and answer session. So for those in the Zoom and for those in the YouTube and in the room, please be engaged, be curious, and prepare your questions as we'll be taking them later on. So please join me in applauding Ibu Noni to the stage to deliver her presentation. Thank you. Ambassador Penny Williams, Dr. Dino Patijalal, and everyone, a very good morning. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Salam sejahtera dan salam sehat untuk kita semua. Ini, and we are so used to wearing masks, you know. Sometimes I forgot to wear lipstick, so luckily today I remembered. <laughs> so when I got the hint to take off my mask, I was ready. Well, um, today we really live in an uncertainties of a lot of things. So I hope, thank you for inviting me to share today in this uh, particular lecture. And I hope our experience in building Bluebird from zero to now will help your uh, future journey ahead. So let me start by uh, the presentation, if I may. I will have uh, quite a number of slides being presented, but some of them I will just go through it very briefly. So if you do have questions later on, please do ask them because we would have enough time to do that. Uh, next one, please. So Bluebird, as mentioned by Ambassador Penny William, our first taxi fleet were imported from Australia. You can see there, it's a Holden Torana. 
And if one day you come over to our headquarters, you would see the real uh, taxi that is still running uh, at this moment. Um, Bluebird started by Ibu Mutiara Siti Fatimah Joko Sutono. She was not a business person. So, in, so when the question asked many times whether an entrepreneur was born or was raised or learned, then I'm a strong believer that being an entrepreneur is to be learned. So we can learn to be an entrepreneur. It doesn't have to be born because she was obviously not an entrepreneur. She was a law lecturer. It was out of necessity in 1965 when uh, our grandfather passed away, she needed to continue being the sole mother who is responsible for the three children. So that's how Bluebird was born, from the two cars to, to currently. And uh, she chose the name Bluebird because Bluebird is a bird of happiness. So whatever kind of business that she was planning to do, her, in her mind, the real happiness, happiness is the happiness of giving. And the main uh, law for that is you can only give if you have. So in order for a business to be sustainable, she kept reminding us the business have to be profitable. So it is not about capitalism only. It is really about the sustainability of the business itself. And then the business was continued by my father as the CEO, and he continuously instilled the basic values of Bluebird itself, which based on honesty, discipline, and hard work, because we strongly believe that sustainable business have to be built brick by brick. We don't believe in instant success. And the fourth one, I think, which is very unique to Bluebird, is the family values. We as a company are very close with each other. I will explain to you more about this. Next slide, please. And then uh, the business is continued by the third generation. So I had the privilege of uh, continuing the business from my father to be the CEO of the company after my father. And you know, when I was asked to replace him, I really didn't feel that I was ready. As we all know, you know, a lot of people said that the third generation normally would, would be the ones who bring the company down. So I had that perception on my shoulder uh, right before the pandemic. So it was a huge challenge for me. But luckily, I was sent to Australia to study by my father uh, in 1989. So Australia, I, I went to University of Newcastle. My experience in Australia really changed the way I think. It really uh, helped me to be more independent, more, pers more persistent, and also more open to different kind of culture. So that kind of education, so the, it's the learning beyond a formal education is the one that made me who I am today. Next one, please. So currently we have more than 23,000 drivers, more than 21,000 vehicles. So, and we all started with two cars in our garage. So we have been the pioneer. We had been the innovator. We had been the disruptor of the transportation industry. But as we all learn, even today, even though you had been the disruptor, you can always be disrupted. So that is another lesson learned. We always have to be ready. And my late grandmother used to, to tell us that you never uh, should feel that you're on top of the mountain. Because after the top of the mountain, it's only downward. So you always have to try to be better. But at the same time, you always have to be grateful that there's so many other people that are less fortunate than you are. So having a right purpose is what drive us uh, th uh, to go through all the challenges that we face. So again, as I mentioned, we were the first to introduce the meter taxi in Indonesia. And we were actually in 2011, we were awarded as the first taxi company in the world. In the world, I'm not so saying about Indonesia or Asia. 
in the world that launched taxi mobile application. This was before Uber was born. But the issue with being the pioneer is also sometimes we're not aware if we were too early in introducing a new technology. So this is a learning lesson as well. But it is okay. It doesn't mean that nobody shall be the pioneer. But our so-called mistake at that moment is we were assuming that when we launched it and the market did not adapt it as well as we predicted, then we thought that the market was not ready. We failed to see and listen that there are other factors involved when we, in, we are the pioneer. At that moment, we thought that people are not just simply didn't want to use the taxi mobile application to do their reservation. We failed to see that actually the infrastructure was the, was the main reason. So we need to be able to look at things, analyze things, analyze the risks beyond to uh, what used to be. Next slide, please. So we were faced with different challenges, and as we all know, the latest one was the pandemic. But as we could see in here, within 72 to 1992, we were faced with different kind of challenges like the Cold War, oil crisis, and being a small startup company. In the beginning, it was very difficult for us to get loan. I'm sure that it's the same thing that is being faced by a lot of startups at this moment. So we need to build our reputation first. We need to build the foundation of who we are in order to get the trust from the financial partners. And as we could see that we had a growth spur right after the economic and political crisis in 1998, right after. And the main reason for that is we had been building the foundation for so long with all of our partners, the financial partner, the suppliers, our customers. So when uh, bad things happened, when uh, Indonesia was facing a huge challenge, we were still being trusted by all of our partners. So that part is very important for any entrepreneurs. Next slide, please. So as we all know, and I mentioned earlier, I think we all living in this, what we call FUCA situation. Uh, volatility, uncertainty, complexity, ambiguity. And I say internally within Bluebird, it's uh, to the power of infinity that we're facing at this moment because it's, it's beyond and it's bigger because the real revolution that we're facing at this moment is a borderless revolution. It's the borderless revolution of time because everything seems to run very quickly and it's also the borderless revolution of a space. So we need to be able to, be, to understand what's, what's going on globally. Did I do something? <laughs> this is technology. You know, sometimes it helps you, sometimes it makes your life a bit miserable too, but that's part of life. So next slide, please. So what did the pandemic bring to us? Yes, the reality is, a lot of businesses went down during pandemic, but also every crisis create opportunities. In every crisis, there always be opportunities. We always have to remember that. It is really a matter of how we see things. We have to be able to uh, see things from the positive point of view, from the opportunity point of view, by understanding our real strength and weaknesses. A lot of times we look out and forget to look within. What helped Bluebird at that moment, even be before pandemic, I think maybe some of you uh, remember in 2016, we were hit by what was called digital disruption. So we were basically uh, challenged by the digital disruption and a lot of people who used to love Bluebird as the bl bird of happiness perceive us as the angry bird at that time, which was not necessarily true. Yes, we were panicking of what's going on, but we were not the angry bird, but that's uh, the reality uh, that the people perceive. So what did we do then? Can we have the next slide, please? 
We continue to learn new things. We try to learn from different kind of customers. We try to learn what really was needed by our current customers then, and also our future customers. I'm talking, uh, this is about uh, 2020 when we got hit by pandemic. In April 2020, our revenue was down by 70%, 70. It was the first time in the 48 years, in the last 48 years before 2020, that we hit a negative in, in our financial statement. So it was a really tough time for us. And again, uh, as you see before, we had more than uh, 50,000 people working under the Bluebird Group umbrella. So we, as an organization, are responsible to make sure that um, they can continue living as well. So we try to learn what is, what is this new uh, normal would be at that time, at the middle, in the middle of the pandemic. So a lot of people still need to have transportation if I want to focus more on transportation. But they need the service, but I don't want to touch anything. So it's, it became a low touch economy in a way. And hygiene become the new currency, if I may say at that time. And we, have, we found this new term, which is a new engagement. It's a new way of doing engagement. Uh, it changed a lot. You know, Indonesians, we, we used to love hugging each other. You know, we always shake hands and suddenly we just simply couldn't do that. So we have to change the way we behave. We have to change the way we engage. And uh, Bluebird is a services industry. It is very important for us to start changing. And we have to start finding new segments because what happened in April, in March 2020, if you notice, Jakarta was completely empty. Nobody get out from their home. And we have so many vehicles. We are a transportation industry. So we have to look for new ways of still continuing to survive at this moment. Next slide, please. So we learn, we adapt, and we transform. But at the heart of it, we choose to continue to innovate and transform while battling the pandemic. So um, as a leader during crisis, we do have to battle two fronts. One is to make sure that the company is afloat because we are standing on a burning platform. But that by itself is not enough. We also need to prepare for the future. So this is what we call as the, being an ambidexter leader. So at the, same t at the same time, you have to do both. You cannot just be a farmer. You also at the same time have to be the hunter. So this is the spirit of entrepreneurship. So next slide, please. But what's most important for Bluebird is that we always focus on people's first. When pandemic hits us, the first thing that we need to uh, take care of are our own people. The men mental health of our people are very important. Otherwise, people cannot fight. Otherwise, we won't be able to survive. If our organization give up, if they don't have the optimism that we will survive this and will prevail, then there is no point of doing anything. So that's the first thing first. So even during pandemic, we continue giving scholarships to the children of our drivers. So during pandemic, us as the top leaders have to continue giving uh, motivations to our drivers who are still having to transport people during pandemic. So we distribute food, we distribute staple food to our drivers to make sure that they can still continue their living. And luckily, since 2016, we started Kartini Bluebird. So we give empowerment to the wives of our drivers. So that uh, small businesses help the family economy during the crisis itself. Next slide, please. So pandemic is not the only disruption we face, as I mentioned earlier. We've been around for 50 years. 50 years is quite a long time for a business, you know, not only as a person, but even as a business. 
So we have faced different challenges, we have done different innovation, but that cannot be enough. We can never be satisfied with our current situation. Yes, Bluebird had been the market leader for the longest time, and yet we got hit by the digital disruption, and yet we got hit by the pandemic. Next slide, please. So we transformed ourselves from just being a taxi company that was born in 1972. We transformed ourselves to be to a mobility as a service company that are focused on three main things. Multi-product, because uh, we need to be able to give, to attend to different needs of transportation. Multi-payment system and multi-channel. That's why we launched collaboration. So we transform ourselves not by not just by strengthening ourselves, but also by opening up. Some people, or you may ask later on, how did we make the decision to be partner with our so-called competitors in 2016? So we launched Go Bluebird in Gojek application, for example. So it is part of transforming ourselves. Next slide, please. But again, as I mentioned, everything we do, the core of our company is the people itself. My late grandmother said that only happy people can make other people happy. So having a purpose beyond numbers is extremely important. Being passionate in everything that you do is very important because that's the one, that is our source of energy. But also you need to persevere because life is not meant to be easy. And in order to be sustainable, in order to scale up, we always have to face different challenges. And I'd like to close this presentation by uh, playing the video of our 50 years. And as you will see in here that this video is made based on true story. This is the reason why Bluebird exists, because of the purpose beyond the numbers. Can we please? Setiap manusia pasti menemui tantangan dalam hidupnya. Seketika beban terasa berat dan jalan keluar seakan sulit ditemukan. Rasa putus asa pun datang saat menyadari bahwa pertolongan yang dibutuhkan sepertinya tak akan pernah datang. Seringkali kita tidak berdaya dan merasa sendiri menghadapi kerasnya dunia. Saat itu pula lah kita mulai kehilangan harapan. Kami menyadari dan kami juga menjadi saksi bahwa harapan itu akan selalu ada jika kita saling peduli. Harapan itulah yang kami tumbuhkan seiring dengan rasa percaya yang terus kami upayakan. Terlihat kecil, tapi kepedulian menjadi nafas kami untuk menjalani pengabdian ini. Sebuah kata bijak mengatakan, kepercayaan bukan hanya didapat dari banyaknya perkataan, melainkan kesesuaian perbuatan. Kami sadar, kepercayaan adalah sesuatu yang harus diraih dalam proses panjang, bukan dengan mudah diminta begitu saja. Kami pun mengerti, Menjadi yang paling lama melayani, bukan jaminan untuk terus menjadi pemenang. Tapi kami bertekad untuk terus menjadi yang terpercaya. Karena setiap kilometer berarti. Setiap jarak yang ditempuh adalah jarak antara harapan dan kebahagiaan. 50 tahun sudah. Kami menjadi saksi perjuangan kehidupan manusia. 
Dan tak hentinya kami terus berupaya untuk meyakinkan bahwa harapan pasti akan selalu ada. Membangun harapan manusianya berarti membangun harapan untuk bangsa dan negara. Kami akan terus bekerja memacu putaran roda untuk ikut serta membangun negeri. 50 tahun kami berbagi kebahagiaan untuk negeri ini. 50 tahun kami hadir untuk melayani Anda dan Indonesia. Thank you. Please give another applause to Ibu Noni. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, we'll be taking a five minute break uh, as the technical team tries to uh, fix the audio system. But in the meantime, I'd like to encourage everybody to start preparing your questions because we'll be opening the Q&A floor after this. Thank you.
press one, two, three. Test one, two, three. I yeah. think this one is better yeah. with the mic. Instead of the Yeah, I can just use mic. Yeah. Because this Okay, mic are you yeah? Okay. Hello, everyone. OK, uh, the good news is that we've solved the audio problem, so hopefully no more feedback. Uh, all good? OK, perfect. Um, now we will begin the Q&A session. So uh, I'm expecting a lot of questions from the public, from you. Uh, and without further ado, let me invite Ibu Noni to join me on the stage. Okay, so I think we've learned a lot about Bluebird's journey and obviously Ibu Noni's uh, leadership experience also matters a lot in trying to overcome the various crises that Bluebird faced from the global financial crisis, Asian financial crisis, disruptor crisis, and many others. So Ibu, I'm wondering if you can share with us what are some of the personal takeaways from your experience during leadership uh, in crisis, managing such a huge company that's revenue was you know, 80% down, 50,000 people, depending on you. What was it felt like and how did you manage it? Thank you. Uh, that is a tough question, actually. But um, as a leader, I think the first thing that you need to do is you need to realize that uh, you are there not just for yourself. As a top leader, you're there to serve everyone who are in the organization. So therefore, you need to be able to get yourself together first because if you're not strong enough, then the organization will collapse with you. So the first thing first is you. I needed to take care of myself at that time, meaning my own mental health. So it, it needs time to, to just reflect on what's going on. Um, I think it is very important at that time that we really look at the facts of what's going on instead of making a lot of psychological assumptions or emotional assumptions. So I think that part is very important. What's going on and what can we learn? What can we learn from the other countries who had faced the pandemic earlier than Indonesia? What's going on there? What did the people do? Not just from our own industry, but also from other industry. And we also try to learn more, and especially at the challenge at that time, we weren't able to have a direct communication, right? And you know, if we have a direct communication, then we can also see the body language. But this time, everything is just digital. So we had to be able to switch. So having a growth mindset, that's the second one that is very important. You need to have a growth mindset. Forget about, okay, um, let me put it this way. At that time, I said to everyone, I'm, um, we have to learn from being this one cell organism, an amoeba. Amoeba has a very strong core, but very, very flexible in the way they take their, their food and digest their food and the way they, um, they just grow. So we need to learn from that kind of behavior. So we need to understand our core strength. What is our core strength? And the rest of it is not important anymore. You know, we need to be able to change our outer layer, if I may say so. But what is also important that we have to stay true to ourselves. So that is where understanding yourself, your business self, is extremely important. Because the last thing the company needs is to just suddenly change to become something else that you don't really understand. So that, that is also a, a challenge at that time. How do we do that? And um, so the first thing I mentioned about ambidextrous leadership, yeah? So the first thing, first thing first, as, as human being, we need to do our own medical health checkup. So the company also needs to do that. So at that time, we really, to we really need to understand uh, what is our financial health? 
what things that we can do now and what things, so prioritization is extremely important during crisis. And having, um, I, I'm not a, a one comment type of leader, but during crisis or so-called at war, we need to have one comment. Everyone need to listen to one comment. But then the idea has to come out from everyone. But as a leader at that time, we need to be decisive. We cannot, you know, uh, be indecisive. That's, that's the worst thing that can happen. But after we make decision, it is also very important for us to be open that our decision may have to be changed or it may not be the right decision uh, at that time, which is okay. You know, but what is important is make your decision and quickly learn and adapt if it needs to be changed. I also give a metaphor within the organization. We could be the best Formula One driver because we, we understand the terrain. We can use all the instruments that we, we learned for, for 50 years. But now we suddenly have to become an off-road rally drivers, which is completely different skill. You have to be able to see things that are different. You know, everything is just so different. Uh, suddenly you can have a tree in front of you falling over. So you have to be ready. Adaptability is the third one that is very important. Being able to adapt, not just to anything, adapt to something that you can uh, adjust to. Not just suddenly change yourself. Okay, so I think that is very important. And also, being able to always find, um, okay, it comes back to what my late grandmother um, used to tell me. Successful people are the ones who can find opportunities in crisis. Successful people are the one who can stand up and run again after each fall. So I think that's, that's what drives me at that time. Um, it doesn't mean that I was not stressed out, and I think it's only human to be stressed out, especially as, as I mentioned earlier, I'm the third generation. I, I cannot afford to have the company fall under, under my hand, you know, under my watch. So, and another thing that is extremely important is not just make your own assumption. Talk to people. That is very important. That's the reason why I still went on the street and talked to the drivers, even during pandemic because only then we really understand what's going on. As a leader, we cannot give a solution without knowing what is the core issue. And we will not know what is the core issue unless we went down to the grassroots. So I think that those parts are very important. Thank you, Boo. Um, another question that I have is, Bluebird has seen many transformations. You've been innovating over periods of time, depending on the market um, developments. Now, one thing that I think the private sector is focusing on right now is how to transition to a green future. Now, you're the largest uh, taxi operator in Indonesia. How do you see Bluebird's strategy moving forward to more sustainable practices? Yes, thank you. Actually, it has been... Uh in our vision since the very beginning that we want to be a, a sustainable company, prosperity of all stakeholders that includes the environment. That's why since the very beginning, my late grandmother always insists on having our own um, service station. So we own our own assets, we own our own service stations. The reason for that is because we want to make sure that every single vehicle that comes out from our depot are in prime condition. Therefore, we do not contribute negatively more than it should be. Of course, every car have a CO2, right? But uh, by having a clean engine, a good engine, um, it will help to reduce unnecessary CO2. That, so we have been doing that since the very beginning. Um, in, 19, uh, in 2019, uh, we launched the uh, electric taxi, zero emission taxi. We launched electric taxi, uh, both in Bluebird and also in Silverbird. Unfortunately, when pandemic hit, our plan to accelerate the implementation of electric taxi, taxi was halted because we need to prioritize uh, our capital at that time. So um, now that the economy started to pick up again, we, on the 20th of June, we just launched our electric taxi in Bali. So we are going to um, 
reposition and reprioritizing uh, our electric vehicles again. And uh, the good news also in, in this front is the Indonesian government is really doing a lot in trying to uh, set up the infrastructures. In the beginning, we want it to be the catalyst uh, because a lot of people are you know, asking you know, whether it's chicken or egg. So I said, you know, okay, we have the chicken and the chicken have to produce more eggs. So, you know, so we want it to be the catalyst uh, for the zero emission transportation in Indonesia. <clears throat> so hopefully with the advancement of infrastructure, with the growth of infrastructure, we together will be able to do that. We have installed enough charging stations for our own fleet. And the government are also planning to install more charging stations. Um, uh, unfortunately, the, the charging stations at this moment are still powered by uh, coal, right? The uh, coal uh, is still the, the main source of energy. So in time, I think, uh, if all of us are doing this together, we would be able to achieve uh, our goal faster. But at Bluebird, <coughs> we did the calculation. So when we launched uh, the electric taxi, we did the calculation. Um, yes, it is much more expensive to buy the vehicle, but it would reduce our maintenance costs by 9%. So we have to do that kind of calculation uh, every time we want to do a, a new investment in things. And hopefully within five years, the cost of the vehicle, of the electric vehicle will come down because the cost of battery uh, will come down. So hopefully by then it will be more affordable. Yes, and I believe this is one of the most important trait that any leader should have, which is uh, being able to see the big picture and thinking long term. And through that, you can take your businesses to scale. Now, this will be my last question before we open it up to the audience. Uh, I'm wondering, um, how are you able to maintain such loyal customers uh, ever since but you know was in high school he's seen bluebird around this morning i took bluebird to, to to get to the embassy and despite whatever disruptions out there you still you're, you're still very much present in the indonesian life so how did you able to do it um it's reciprocal <laughs> um i think what is important again uh, i mentioned earlier that we're focused on the people and because we are a service industry so only happy people can make other people happy. So the first thing that we focus on is our own people, right? How do we recruit our drivers? Um, the way we recruit our drivers is pretty intensive, uh, actually, because um, they have to go through um, an interview by a psychologist to try to map their, their tendency, their emotional tendency. And then they have to pass uh, practical tests done by our senior drivers because the comfort, the reliability is very important in the way our drivers drive. I think that is one of the uniqueness that, that you feel. But it has to go beyond that. We need to be able to feel that the drivers are doing it because they can give something to our customers. Um, I think it is part of our trainings that you know what, if we make our customers happy, it is also a blessing to us because it will make ourselves happy. And of course, as a company, we have to tie it with our benefits and also with our punishment. So we cannot just preach without installing system in how to appreciate the good things that our drivers do. And also, we need to be able to um, see if there is any flaws happening in the operation. Those things are very important. So we, we take things seriously, and also the, the transparency, the governance, and uh, those things are the one that helps us running a reliable transportation company. So from that, uh, we develop a relationship with our customers, because trust is earned. So trust has to be earned. We cannot just expect people to trust us just because we said so. We really need to do it daily. Great. Uh, so now I'll open it up to the audience. Uh, for those students who'd like to ask a question, please raise your hand. And then, OK, the, the lady in white over up there, and then the gentleman on the middle section. Please state your. Please state your name and your question.
Thank you for this opportunity. Uh, Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh, Bu Nuni. Nice to meet you, Bu. Mm, my name is Putri Elita Wain Siregar. I am a postgraduate student from the School of Government Public Policy. And now uh, I'm doing my thesis proposal in regards of the entrepreneurial things uh, policy in the era society 5.0. Discussion about the entrepreneur, uh, entrepreneurial things. Today we are facing the situations when the channel distribution, information, and manufacturing can be done by many people. Everything um, opened, who agile and has a good narration will be taken an advantage. And paradoxical, it will be disadvantage for the big names such as Starbucks, McDonald's, Coca-Cola, and so on. My question is, how about your insight about this phenomenon, the local, uh, the local to the new global concept? Thank you. Thank you. I move on to the second question. Hello. Okay. Hello, everyone. Pa, bo. I'll just ask an easy, easy question. question. So, so, is developing an innovative business and scaling it really necessary? With the current state of international economies during this post-pandemic period, and with widespread news of an alarming and upcoming recession, escalated by the halting of food production and food exports, directly caused by the Russo-Ukrainian war. Ukraine and Russia is the highest exporters of grain, but innovation is a, is a must to every business. So my question is, is it still necessary to scale an innovative business when existing or legacy ones are already at major risk? Thank you. Thank you. So I think you can take those two questions at a time. That is definitely not an easy question. <laughs> so the first, the first thing, I think it is very important uh, for Indonesia to have to develop the local economy, especially now. It doesn't mean that we can't seclude our, ourselves from uh, having relationship with other countries, because we are. As, as I mentioned earlier, the real revolution now is a borderless revolution, right? So, but it is important if we want to, I think there, there's so many uh, new entrepreneurs now that started from local. I don't know if I can mention some, some brands in here, like for example, Kopi Kenangan, for example, right? It's, it's a local company. It's focused on uh, different things. So I think the market is so big if you want to start something, as long as you can give a solution to what is the gap at this moment. What Kopi Kenangan, because I had the privilege of having Kopi Kenangan at Endeavor, it's, it's part of the organization that I, I'm in as well. Um, so they managed to, to find this gap. You know, they want to give opportunity for certain market segmentation to also enjoy good coffee with reasonable pricing. So. Uh, I think we shall not see things the same way as before. Whatever the established businesses have already established at this moment, they have their own market segmentation. They have their own market focus. They have their own services. So what can you bring that is unique or can fill in the gap? I, I don't believe that any single company would feel uh, the need of the whole spectrum. There's always an opportunity in, in any different ways. And understanding the local needs, I think, is very important. That's, that's how uh, this local company can grow. But local company needs to have a global mindset in order to accelerate their growth. I think small company needs to be able to learn from the extensive experience from the older company, but vice versa the bigger company and the older company also needs to learn from the new company um, about their agility, about the new energy, the way they're being able to see things very differently to the old way of seeing things. So I think it has to be uh, mutually uh, learned. And I am a strong uh, supporter of a local company 
who wants to go global. Everyone start from their own garage, including McDonald's, including Starbucks. So you always have to start from zero and then you have to grow from there. Then I guess it related to your questions. Do we still need to grow? Of course, otherwise we die. You know, we, we may not necessarily grow in the same way. We need to adjust our growth to the current needs also. We need to adjust our growth. For example, um, when we decided to uh, launch the electric taxi, we plan to replace at least 50% of our taxis, or our fleet, which is 21,000, by the way, within five years. But we need to adjust. We cannot grow that particular uh, plan. We need to be able to adjust it. We'll grow it later. So we always need to adjust our growth according to the current ecosystem, the, according to the current supply and demand. At this moment, everyone is facing with the supply issue, for example, in, in, the, in the value chain. And so that by itself, even though we want to grow as fast as we want, we can't. So we, we need to be able to adjust. So Bahasa Jawa in Bahasa Jawa is you have to ngejejek, you know, to the earth. Your, your legs have to be always on the earth. You cannot fly all the time, even though you, you need to fly from time to time. So I think, I hope that that answers your question. Thank you. Great. Can I invite more students to please your raise your hand if you'd like to ask a question? One at the top right there, um, and then the gentleman in pink down here. But while we wait for them to prepare their question, uh, we have two questions coming in from Zoom. First uh, is from Sarah and Mary from Monash University. Uh, she's asking, uh, Ibu Noni, you mentioned a lesson learned from Bluebird's innovation during the inception of online-based transportation, which didn't result well. So how do we know if it's the right time for our business innovation? That's the first one. And then another one from Brad Lucas from Hobart University. What is your prescription in ensuring that your team is always in a good performance, even during the pandemic? Okay. We don't know when is the right time unless we try. <laughs> <laughs> the key is make a decision, you try it, you iterate. I think the thing, the lesson learned for me personally, that we did not iterate fast enough and wide enough. We made our assumptions of why people do not adapt the new technology instead of really extensively communi getting uh, an open communication and getting the feedback. So I think that is what's important. But again, you know, we can only, we can only do the risk analysis so much. And I, I always um, share this uh, internally also. You can rely on your, in, you can rely only about 30 to 40% on your intuition and you have to be back 60 to 70% by data. But data only will never be sufficient. You always have to make the decision and try and iterate. As long as you're open, as long as you're open to, to know that, okay, I, you know, to me, it's okay to fail, you know, but for some people, maybe you take it too harshly, you know, if you fail. I think failure is, is a way to learn new things. You know, you, you, can't, you can't learn new things unless you fail. So, um, so don't, don't be afraid to try. Don't be, don't be too aggressive also. You need to do, to do your risk analysis. But then again, try it and iterate it and try again and adjust it again. And um, the second one, how do we keep uh, people in the whole organization always on their toes? First, the leader have to do that. So it always start from the leader. Um, you know, I have to, I always say that, you know, I always have to keep myself hungry, even though we have a lot of food on our table. So you always have to feel hungry. You always need hungry of, uh, uh, knowledge, yeah, not not really hungry, not literally hungry of food, <laughs> but, uh, but you know, you always have to keep yourself hungry. You know, you always need to, you know. Okay, I have this uh, life life uh, statement. I want to be remembered as a good daughter, a good mother, and a good partner. What is the characteristic of a good daughter? You know, when you see a child always eager to learn something new. You know, as we grow older, 
we lost that eagerness. That's the thing that we need to keep, to always be eager. So then how do we do this to make sure that every single person in the organization have the same kind of eagerness? The answer is it's impossible because everyone is different. That's the reality of it. So what do we need to do as a leader? We need to identify who is actually uh, the same as us, you know, very energetic, very optimist, want to make changes, want to be able to transform, and who are the group who are wait and see, because there, there will always be some people who are like that, and the groups who are really resenting change. We need to be able to identify those, not be in denial, because those, those are facts and reality of life. So once you identify those groups, you bring the champions the one who carry the transformation over and doing uh, the project and share the, the success. Sharing the success is very important. And then the middle group, who are the wait and see kind of group, will join immediately after they see success. We don't have to bother so much about the people who resent changes because they're your energy vampires but you need to be able to identify them so you know how to avoid. So they will eventually, either they um, separate themselves or they will eventually move to the second group and move to the first group. So we need to be able to identify those people. And we always need to find our own energy. My own energy is to to be able to always talk to our drivers and to make sure that every single person are happy enough and to make sure that every single children of our drivers can get a good education. And that is my energy. And in order to be able to do that, I need to make sure the company is performing well. Otherwise, we cannot give if we don't have, right? So it comes back, it's, it comes back to the purpose itself. Thank you, Ibu. Um, let me take the first question from the gentleman there. Uh, Please stand up. Ibu Noni. Uh, and thank you for the opportunity. Uh, in your presentation, you mentioned early on, on digital disruptors. And I was wondering, as we all know, uh, the state digital disruptors has a leverage because they do not require physical investment and rely on digital infrastructure. And I was wondering uh, for Bluebird to maintain its market share and market competitiveness, um, does the does Bluebird model of business that requires um, vehicles and trainings of uh, the human resources, is it a, a risk or an opportunity when we compare them with the state digital competitors? Thank you. Thank you. And uh, then the second. Okay. Yes, Felix from Venus. Thank you. Thank you. And the second question from the lady over at the top section. Uh, Never mind, the gentleman. Thank you for the opportunity. My name is Pablo Aaron from Kitahara Pali University. First, I would like to thank Madam Ambassador Penny, Dr. Dino, Ibunoni, and Esther, as well as Madam Secretary Emma. I would like to ask when we talk about innovation, innovative business, especially in terms of startups, how does businesses make sure that they can serve the greater good of the public, as mentioned in the video, the 50th anniversary of Bluebird, that Bluebird are more than just numbers, but also to serve the public. And Dr. Dino mentioned that Entrepreneurship is the drive, one of the key drivers of a country's economy. And how, does this, how do these businesses make sure that they can serve the greater public good as well as being the key driver of a country's economy in terms of scaling up businesses? Thank you. Thank you. These are two different questions, so I hope I would remember the second question after I answer <laughs> the first one. Please remind me if I forgot. Um, so um, the, the, the question is about digitalization. Uh, the, that's the first question, right? The question is... Um, oh, asset heavy. Asset, yeah. Okay, the asset heavy. So uh, as any new innovation, uh, I would say it's like a pendulum. You know, it will eventually settle in the middle. There will be an equilibrium. 
So what is right and what is wrong? You never know. So what is important is that uh, what, what is the strength of Bluebird of having the assets ourselves? Because then we can make sure every single vehicle and every single, we can make sure more on the quality side. Is that means that we're gonna stay rigidly as only an asset heavy company? No. So we need to be able to adjust. It's part of tran our transformation as well. So we have been uh, introducing new line of service. So we work together with partners in different cities. So we're providing the technology, we're providing the training services, and they're the one who have the vehicles. And it, every company is different. Every company may give a different type of services. As, uh, as what is known as this uh, light, light assets company, they may uh, after a different kind of service compared to our kind of service, which is fine, it's just different. But what is important when we talk about technology, technology should be used, should be embraced by every single company to make the company better. With the, the advancement of technology, because we are an asset-heavy company, it is more important for us to adapt uh, to adopt the new technology because we need to make sure that every single vehicle is being productive and efficient. And when we only have two cars, we still can see it with our eyes. We still can calculate it by our hands. But when we have 21,000 vehicles on the road and we're maintaining uh, the fleet ourselves, you know, we need uh, the, uh, the technology to help us to, to make uh, our business efficient and productive. So at the end of the day, the sweet spot is when we can find the intersection between the advancement of technology that can support the advancement of humanity and it's economically viable. I think that's the thing that we need to look for. Um, so it is not whether which one is better, asset heavy or asset light. Both have its positive side, both have its negative side. It really depends on, on the business itself. Um, and the second question is, uh, how do we ensure that Bluebird also contributes to national economic growth and become part of public service? Yes, every company may have different purpose. So I can't represent every single company. But since day one, Bluebird was uh, born to be able to give back. Because that's, what's amana in, in English? Mandate. <laughs> that's a mandate from my late grandmother. So the only reason why we need to grow is so that we can give more. And we strongly believe that that's why we're focusing on education, we're focusing on uh, small businesses by empowering the wives of our drivers, because we strongly believe that we have to do beyond just our business as usual to take part in the advancement of Indonesia itself. Uh, we need, yes, uh, we, we employ a lot of people, and, but that, that is just the mean, that's just the vehicle. What is important is what do they do with their children? The family economy have to be able to uh, be enough in order for the children to get a higher education because the children are our future. So I think that is our company uh, purpose. But again, every different company, every company is different. Every company have different way of contributing back as well. Thank you, Ibu. Uh, and this will be the final question from Zoom. Uh, from Monash University, Adeline Anderson would like to ask you, it takes courage and difficult decision-making process in implementing innovation to business. So what's your formula? <laughs> Tell us the secret, Bu. <laughs> uh, in, in Bahasa Indonesia, it's called tambeng. <laughs> it's the positive side of being stubborn. <laughs> so um, I think... Uh, in being able to make the decision out of the difficult choices. I think that is important. Um, especially when you're a CEO of a company, when you're an entrepreneur, you always need to be able to make difficult decisions. Um, I think that, and, and you know, learning from um, older people, more experienced people, a lot from talking to the drivers, 
I learned a lot from talking to the mechanics who were fixing the vehicles. I learned a lot from our customers. I learned a lot from my three daughters. So I think that's, that's what's important. And being able to love yourself and forgive yourself, it's what gets you going. Because honestly, it is really lonely at the top. So, so you, need, you need to embrace that. You just simply need to embrace that. And again, make your decision be, uh, based on the best possible alternatives. I think that's, that's what uh, keeps us going. Thank you. I hope that answers the question. That answers it. Please give a round of applause for Ibu Noni. So over the past one hour, we've learned a lot uh, from you, Ibu, from your wealth of experience and wisdom. Thank you so much for sharing it to us. We've learned that in order to be a good leader, you need to have an open mind. And thankfully, your education in Australia prepared you for that as well. You need to keep talking to people, people at the bottom, people at the middle, people at the top. So this way you can continuously transform yourself to become the better version of yourself and your business or your organization if you're leading an organization. Um, and this is what we do, Ibu, at the virtual campus to campus outreach program over the past two years we've brought great mentors from Indonesia to connect students from Indonesia and Australia and in 2022 we have you as one of our distinguished speaker and we have also Pak Katip Basri and Ibu Yeni Wahid as another mentor for the students here um, and on behalf of FPCI and Australian Embassy we'd like to showcase and share with you what was it like to become part of this program through this video highlight that we'll be playing on the screen Please give another round of applause. Can I uh, add one more from the of course. So I think what is important, what I learned also from, from my grandmother, my mother and my father and everyone around me, I think it is important for us to be humble, be kind and be brave. There you go. Wonderful. Thank you so much for all the students here. You've been such a great audience. Uh, and I'd like to pass the mic back to the MC to carry on with the event, Emma. Thank you everyone and thank you Ibunani for such an insightful presentation and my Esther for moderating such a fruitful discussion. I think that five minute break was a great opportunity for everyone to think up some really, really good questions for, for our very distinguished guest here today. On behalf of the Australian Embassy, I'd like to thank Pak Dino and the Foreign Policy Community of Indonesia for co-hosting today's hybrid lecture. And I'd also like to thank those of you joining us today in person, all 107 of you and uh, those joining us online from Monash University in Australia and across Indonesia and Australia as well. To find out more about activities and events that are being hosted at the Australian Embassy in Jakarta, I again encourage you to follow us on social media. Again, we are at Dubez Australia on Twitter, at Kedubez Australia on Instagram, and at Australian Embassy Jakarta on Facebook. And you can also follow FPCI on their channels at FPCI Indo on Twitter and Instagram. Before we wrap up, I'd like to invite everyone here today to join a quick photo session with Ambassador Williams, Pak Dino and Ibunoni. I'll ask you to keep your masks on, but you may want to stand up and we'll have our photographer, Ferdi, come and take some photos.
everyone's ready. All right. One, two, three. And what about a fun one, thirty? <laughs> yeah, maybe a li maybe a little fun one. Everyone can. Oh, sure. One more with my camera so I can tweet it. Which pose? Yeah. 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 Uh, horizontally. The fun one, I guess, right? One, two, and three. Thank you, everyone. If there's no photo for social media, it didn't happen, right? <laughs> okay, Baikla, thank you very much for joining us today. Uh, for those of you here in the room, we have lunch boxes available from Tony, Toby's Estate, uh, one of our alumni businesses, uh, as well as coffee as well. So on your way out of the theatre, there will be lunch boxes available that you can choose from. Thank you to everyone today and thank you again to all of our guests. It was wonderful to have you here. Thank you.